This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. This is Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I began this podcast over four years ago now to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological and emotional issues. Maybe you're in therapy. And to those of you also who might just have been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, or you're having relationship problems that you really would love to run by a therapist but also to a third group of you, those of you who might be very wary of some therapist. Say, I'd never darken the door of somebody like that, but you're curious enough or you're struggling enough to listen to self-work. So welcome to all of you. Today we're going to focus on your gut and how recent research is finding that it may have more to do with depression and anxiety than was ever realized in the past. Believe it or not, there's a second, somewhat independent nervous system in your body. Not the autonomic nervous system, which we all learn about in high school, but this one's called the enteric nervous system. And it communicates with the brain through the vagus nerve, which is really two nerves, they're the longest nerves in your body, by the way, that travel in kind of a wandering fashion from many internal organs up to the brain stem. I was fascinated to learn, for example, that 80% of that travel is not from the brain down, but from the gut up. Certainly puts a different perspective on having a gut feeling or butterflies, doesn't it? We'll also focus on half a dozen things you can do to stimulate the vagus nerve, which somewhat contradictorily sounding, even though it's called stimulation, it slows down your heart rate and calms you. That's your parasympathetic nerve system working. Anyway, some fascinating things for this 228th episode of Self Work, once again sponsored by Athletic Greens. Our listener email today is from someone who says that her mom laid a big guilt trip on her when she was a child, and now she guilts herself for everything and far too readily feels guilty for too many things. And of course, she wants to know what she can do about it, which I try to at least take a stab at every week. So welcome to Self Work. Sit back, relax drive, run, whatever you're doing. I'm so glad you're here and very, very grateful. The autonomic nervous system is made up of two nervous systems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which you probably learned about in biology class or maybe by now in junior high. I learned it in high school. The sympathetic nervous system doesn't turn on because you tell it to. In fact, neither one of these do. Let me quote an article here. The sympathetic nervous system makes up part of the autonomic nervous system, also known as the involuntary nervous system. Without conscious direction, the autonomic nervous system regulates important body functions such as heart rate, blood pressure, pupil dilation, body temperature, sweating, digestion. And it's distinct types of nerve cells called neurons that control these physical reactions by directing the action of the skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle, gland secretion, etc. The system allows animals to make quick internal adjustments and react without having even to think about it. The sympathetic nervous system directs the body's rapid involuntary response to dangerous or stressful situations. A flash flood of hormones boosts the body's alertness and heart rate, sending extra blood to the muscles. Breathing quickens, delivering fresh oxygen to the brain, and an infusion of glucose is shot into the bloodstream for a quick energy boost. This happens so quickly that people often don't even realize it's taken place. They give the example that a person may jump away from the path of a falling tree before they fully register that it's about to topple on them. But there's one problem. The sympathetic nerve system, or that system that does the fight-or-flight reaction, can't turn itself off necessarily. It can tell itself to keep going, but it depends on its counterpart, the parasympathetic nervous system, to jump in and start running the show to calm you down. Again, I'm reading from a Life Science article. To counter the fight-or-flight response, this system encourages the body to rest and digest. Blood pressure, breathing rate, and hormone flow return to normal levels as the body settles into homeostasis or equilibrium. Okay, that was a lot of information. 
Most of us learned that at some point. Maybe we've forgotten it, but we did learn about it. One system can't be turned on when the other one is on. So if your parasympathetic nerve system or your rest and digest nervous system, it turns off your flight or fight and vice versa. Unfortunately, what happens is that stress and how we perceive stress can paint it as being in imminent danger. So your fight or flight reaction, your sympathetic nervous system kicks on, which causes all kind of havoc and damage in the body. Now, I learned about all that in graduate school, too, but that was about it. When I was a music therapist, I did a lot of guided imagery. I play some calming music in the background and guide people through a series of muscle relaxation suggestions and then take them or invite them into a calming scene of some kind where their own mind's eye would begin to notice things. And then as the music ended, I'd invite them to slowly come back into their bodies. Some people fell asleep. I could hear snoring. Others got really relaxed. What we were trying to do with guided imagery is turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. But now, it's so exciting to learn about what gut researchers, researchers who study diseases like IBS or Crohn's, celiac, or just plain old constipation and diarrhea, they're looking for cures. And of course, so many people who have these diseases also have depression or anxiety. Autoimmune researchers are also vastly interested in this enteric nervous system. Now, what does enteric mean? Enteric means relating to the intestines. I, for example, take enteric-coated aspirin for my heart. That means the aspirin is coated in something that resists dissolving in the stomach. So it can be absorbed in the small intestine and head out to the bloodstream where it can do some good, hopefully. So again, there's this whole other nervous system that is in your gut called the enteric nervous system. Now, I'm going to go on and read a bit of an article because, again, these people can explain it far better than I can. So what does the enteric nervous system do? Its main role is to control digestion from swallowing to the release of enzymes that break down food to the control of blood flow that helps with nutrient absorption to elimination. It doesn't seem to be capable of thought as we know it, but it communicates back and forth with our big brain with profound results. And this is what is absolutely fascinating. For decades, researchers and doctors thought that anxiety and depression contributed to gastrointestinal problems like IBS or constipation or diarrhea. But other studies more recently have shown it may be the other way around. Researchers are finding evidence that irritation in the gastrointestinal system may send signals to the central nervous system, their brain, that trigger mood changes. Just remember, I said earlier that 80% of those neurons that are in the vagus nerve that go from the gut to the brain are going up, right? They're not coming down. It's fascinating. So your enteric nervous system might actually trigger emotional shifts in you not the other way around, as I said. Before we learn more and find out about the role of bacteria in your gut, which is kind of disgusting, (laughs) let's hear from Athletic Greens, a product whose own research shows that nutrition and gut health have so much to do with mental health. Again, I'm using it every day. It's so worth it because I don't use the whole scoop. I use about half a scoop, but half a scoop, I'm getting a huge percentage of benefits. It's just that I don't like it quite that strong. So listen to the information and see what you think. When Athletic Greens reached out to me, I of course said I'd need to try the product, and I was actually shocked. It tastes great with cold water, and I felt more focused. I've had better digestion and energy. Even my non-health conscious husband is loving it. Let me give you some facts. They call it a life-changing nutritional habit. To me, it's like giving yourself a gift every morning. It contains 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, including probiotics and something called adaptogens. It fits all kinds of diets and has less than one gram of sugar. And it's easy. One scoop in the morning and you can do away with so many of those other expensive supplements that you swallow every night. And because I said a fervent yes to their sponsorship, you can visit athleticgreens.com slash selfwork. And along with the product, you'll receive a free year supply of vitamin D3, and most of us are deficient, and K2 in one tiny drop, as well as five convenient travel packs. Again, go to athleticgreens.com slash self-work and experience it yourself. You know, I always focus on what you can do about it, and Athletic Greens fits the bill. (music) 
Okay, we're digging a little deeper in your gut, so to speak. In an article appearing in Science That Matters, when researchers study gut bacteria called microbes, now again, let's stop because I had to look up what a microbe was. And a microbe includes bacteria, protozoa, fungi, algae, amoebas, and slime molds. Many people think of microbes as causes of disease, but every human is actually the host to billions of microbes, and most of them are essential to our life. It sounds kind of disgusting, but all those things growing in us that we started accumulating as soon as we were given birth, in fact, when we went through the birth canal, microbes began coming into our bodies, and they're actually keeping us alive. Okay, back to the Science That Matters post. So these microbes perform an array of bodily tasks, and further studies show how some might affect mental health. Each of us, it turns out, is more microbe than human. Bacterial cells outnumber human cells in the body by a factor of at least 1.3 to 1. You're more microbe than you are human. It's incredible. The human gut plays host to more than 100 trillion of these bacteria, a complex interdependent microbial universe wedged between your rib cage and spine. Many of these bacterial genes help build molecules that let you digest food, keep harmful microbes at bay, and even feel emotions. But believe it or not, the bacteria in your gut produce about 90% of the serotonin in your body. That same hormone that regulates your moods, promotes well-being, if you're taking an SSRI, that's a synthetic serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac, like Zoloft, like Lexapro. Those involve serotonin, and actually a lot of your serotonin is coming from your gut. Now, all these articles will be in the show notes just to let you know, because I know it's material that we don't often think about. So let's talk a little bit more about how this gut bacteria could alter how you think, feel, or act. This is another intriguing fact, I think. The gut microbiome, as it's called, weighs about 2 kilograms, and our brains weigh 1.4. And this researcher says they may have just as much influence over our bodies. And what they're saying is, since this gut bacteria can make and use nutrients and other molecules in ways the human body cannot, it's really very tantalizing is the word they use to think of what this could mean for new therapy, for depression, for anxiety. The messages just simply need to be decoded. And I don't mean that simply like it's going to be simple. (laughs) One more article that I thought was an interesting piece of information Researchers have also noticed an increase in depression in people taking antibiotics. Again, the antibiotics would fight off the bacteria in the gut. You would have less bacteria in your gut if you were taking an antibiotic because you were sick, or it would change that. I'm probably speaking way too simplistically, but it would change how many of those bacteria you have in your body. And so what they're finding is that after you take antibiotics, you have more depression. So what's the deal there? There's one more part of the body I want to briefly touch on, again, just to give you a a sense of what's going on down there. (laughs) It's called the vagus nerve. What I've noticed these days is how very well a couple of new books are doing that are on the market about one certain avenue that the gut and the brain use for communication. We've mentioned it earlier. It's on the vagus nerve. It's called vagus because it literally wanders all over everywhere in your gut and then heads up to your brainstem like a vagabond. So when you get nauseated with fear or you can't eat because you're emotionally stressed out or when you get surprised, you feel as if your stomach is coming up in your throat, there's a reason for that. I can't look over a second floor window because I've got a fear of heights and all of a sudden my stomach starts feeling as if it's queasy. Now I know that somehow my vagus nerve and my brain are talking to each other. Now the what I presented is basic information, but I've already talked about how depression isn't simply a chemical imbalance. That's a two-part series, which was episode 142 and 143, if you want to listen. All of this I've learned about more recently, but again, we're going to talk about what you can do about it. Somewhat contradictorily, when the vagus nerve is stimulated, it slows your heart rate, so it's calming. And what they're finding is there's some very simple things to do to calm your vagus nerve. First, it's just breathing. I often have people in my office lie down on the floor and I put a book on their chest 
And I say, don't make that book go up when you breathe. But if you are breathing diaphragmatically, whereas your diaphragm goes down and then comes back up, it will move that book. You don't want to push the book out. But that is how you can tell if you're diaphragmatically breathing. You know, a lot of us hold our breath. If you focus on your breath and you want to aim for six breaths per minute, and what you want to do is breathe in for five, hold for seven, and breathe out for nine. So breathe in for five. Hold, three, four, five, six, seven, and then blow out just like you were going to blow up a balloon. So I've got my lips kind of pursed just a little bit. If you practice that kind of breathing, it's going to calm you down. Okay. Now, again, when you hold, you don't clamp down and hold. You just allow the oxygen to go through all your body, and then you blow out carbon dioxide. So you want to breathe more deeply from the belly. You want to think about expanding your abdomen and widening your rib cage as you inhale. That exhale is what triggers the relaxation response. So you may feel silly trying it, but my gosh, if it calms you down, that's great. Now, these are kind of odd things that also stimulate the vagus nerve. Loud gargling with water (laughs) or loud singing activates our vocal cords, which in turn stimulate the vagus nerve. Isn't that interesting? Made me think that's why I was thinner when I was a singer, because, you know, stress makes it harder to get rid of fat. So, (laughs) oh, I should start singing again. Foot massage. Interesting. I love that. Cold water face immersion, meaning immerse your forehead, eyes, and at least two-thirds of both cheeks into cold water. This elicits the vagus nerve. Now, your friend might think you're crazy, (laughs) but if it helps. Eating fiber stimulates vagus impulses. So pears, strawberries, avocado, apples, raspberries, bananas, carrots, beets, broccoli, artichoke, Brussels sprouts, lentils, kidney beans, dark chocolate, thank God that's on there, chickpeas, quinoa, oats, popcorn, split peas, almonds, and chia seeds. Those are the top 21. Then the last way you can stimulate that vagus nerve is laugh. Having a good laugh lifts your mood, boosts your immune system, and that vagus nerve gets stimulated. So it's nice to know that we have an advantage in stressful situations when we are being affected negatively. We can stimulate our vagus nerves to send a message to our bodies that it's time to relax and de-stress. And you can teach your children this too. Teach them to sing. Let them sing together and see what happens. It's really quite amazing. And as a former music therapist, I know the power of music and laughter can be very strong. So here's our listener email for today. Hello, Dr. Rutherford. I have a question about me and my mom, I guess. When I was little, my mom was very abusive to me and my siblings. And I noticed growing up that she made me feel guilty about a lot of things. And throughout my adulthood, I feel guilty about even the smallest things, and I do not know how to stop. So I'm hoping you might have some suggestions for me or maybe some advice. It sounds as if this listener has taken over where her mom left off. It's no longer her mom's voice she hears, but her own. Her belief about herself is that she must be responsible for all around her. She doesn't explain necessarily what she feels guilty for. And let's not forget that some guilt can be a good thing, meaning that if you made a mistake or hurt someone, you're going to feel guilty. Maybe you lost your temper. Who knows? Guilt can lead you to apologize and try to do better. But guilt is about an act. You feel guilty for doing something. What I would want to ask this listener, two questions, or I'll ask you two questions. Does it feel like you make what goes wrong around you your fault, meaning you take a one-down position all the time? You say to yourself, I must have done something to cause this to happen. You take way too much responsibility for things, and that's not a good conscience. That's a bad habit. The second question I would ask is, or do you feel like you're a bad person? Because that's not guilt, that's shame. And that means you're finding evidence all around you that you are a bad person. You're an unworthy person. There are lots of ways to approach this. You can do some work with a therapist or by yourself to go back and reconnect with the feelings you had when you were blamed by your mother, 
find that anger or confusion, write about it, journal about it, express it. And often when you work through those feelings, you'll be able to catch yourself doing it in the present because you'll literally say, wait a minute, this is making me feel just like I did when I was with my mom or when I was a child, and I've done nothing wrong. But you have to do the emotional work first. You can look at your relationships and see if you've been attracted to others. that are fine with you taking the blame because they rarely or never do. So that's a relationship issue. If it's shame, then healing from that is a bit more complex. And I recommend listening to an episode that was very, very early on, number nine. But I also talked about shame in, well, actually, I've talked about shame a lot, but I focus on it specifically in 91. So good luck to you. I want to thank you all for being here today. I've gotten extra reviews on Apple Podcasts, and I get other reviews on other podcast platforms for self-work, and they mean so much. A recent one said that she'd really been searching for a podcast that would help her and that she's listening now to mine every day and how much that has helped her. Thank you so much for letting me know that in that review. I do read them all. Even if they are slightly negative, that's important information for me too. And I want to tell you that Perfectly Hidden Depression is one of the number one book purchases in Poland now that it has gotten translated into Polish. I'm very pleased. I I hear that country really struggles with perfectionism, and so maybe this book will help someone. Perfectly Hidden Depression is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble It is more of a workbook, so some of these very exercises I was telling the listener to do are exercises that are in the book and guide you through that. Again, many perfectionists do not think that they're perfectionists because they never feel like they get anything perfect, but you might want to go to a questionnaire that if you go to my website, drmargaretrutherford.com, and search for questionnaire, then you'll find this questionnaire, and if you take it, the book might just be good for you. It's called Perfectly Hidden Depression. Another reason to sign up to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com is that you get a weekly newsletter, and that holds within it my podcast and my blog post and gives you any other news about me, like if I might be speaking somewhere or something I just think you'd be interested in. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I read all of them. Again, I cannot answer all, but I do read. Or you can leave me a speak pike message. I'm getting a lot of those messages, but some of them I either can't hear or understand. So please be in a quiet place because the microphone isn't strong enough to pick up your voice if you're whispering or if there's a lot of noise in the background. You can also join my Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. And don't forget the offer from Athletic Greens, which is athleticgreens.com slash self-work. Again, my gratitude for your being here. Please take very good care in these still strange times. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.